Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Schuler. I'm a GP over uh, in Easter Bay of Plenty, and I'm here today with Dr. Alex Lampen Smith, who's a gastroenterologist in Tottenham Hospital. Um, firstly, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. As I say, I'm a GP over in Kowaro, um, which is a small town in the Eastern Bay of Plenty, um, high Māori population, high needs, um, you know, poorly resourced, um, interesting job. And um, I've been there for five years. And I also work at the local PHA as clinical director. And I have a role at the DHB as a GP liaison. Um, and Alex is here with us from Tarong and she'll tell you a little bit about herself first. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. So yeah, so I'm at the DHB as a gastroenterologist with a special interest in liver disease. And I also work um, for the Hepatitis Foundation of New Zealand, um, where we provide services for people around the country with Hepatitis B. Great, thank you. So really, I guess where we'll start is, can you tell us a little bit about what is the Hepatitis Foundation? Most GPs will have heard of it, or most of us know the name, some will know more, but it'd be great to just hear a little bit about what they do. Yeah, so we are um, a charitable organisation um, with a contract with, directly with the Ministry of Health to provide and run a monitoring programme for people affected by hepatitis B. So at the moment in New Zealand, we have approximately between 15 and 20,000 people um, under monitoring with us, but we suspect that in the New Zealand context, there's probably about 100,000 people affected by hepatitis mm. B. And we know that through um, Statistics New Zealand, ethnicity data, immigration data, that sort of thing. So we know there's a lot of people out there. On our team, we have um, here in Pakistan, our, our head office, we have um, dedicated admin staff who run the monitoring, sending out blood test forms regularly. We also have um, a group of community nurses based at different places around the North Island, and they can um, do patient in, uh, education. Um, patient visits as yeah. well as um, yeah, supporting people in the community and then we have myself and my colleague Dr Chris Moyes who um, work part-time for the foundation providing um, the specialist oversight and referral and discussion with specialists and GPs where needed. Great, oh, thanks. So in terms of as a GP if I um, am worried about a patient um, with hepatitis B or I want some advice or information I want the patient to be seen by somebody how would I go about um, referring them? Yeah, so referrals to the foundation um, can be anything from old school to new school. So we'll take phone and fax and email referrals, but also our um, patient management system is um, recently redesigned and all cloud-based and is compliant with all data and privacy rules. And we now are directly linked into um, MedTech, um, Care Select, and all of the major yeah. GP um, patient management systems. So you can do referrals in your own GP system into our, into our organisation. Um, and then what we do is we um, enrol the patient in our foundation, our community nurses will make contact with that person who's been newly referred and give one-on-one um, -on -one patient education yeah. with, about hepatitis B. We can talk to that person about whether their whana or household members need to be screened um, about what, and also discuss about what their risk factors may be and then um, get them on our monitoring program. And then over the course of subsequent years when we're doing that monitoring, if blood tests come through that show that the liver is um, inflamed or the virus is active, and then we can sort of trigger a few extra steps. So we would monitor that our nurses might make contact with the patient again, what's happening, is the person unwell from other things, um, and then if it is the hepatitis B that we think is active and causing problems, then we can do a couple of things. And I think this is where there's potential to link back in with GPs. Mm. So sometimes treatment can be done um, in secondary care, but sometimes it, it can be done by the GPs as well. That's great to hear, and I think you know a lot of things now we're working towards trying to have integrative uh, programs where GPs and secondary can work together um, push more care back out to general practice and a lot of that is having the resource and the training education for GPs to feel confident. Um, I know that a lot of GPs find hepatitis B a really confusing, really complex condition and most of us will have learned you know, a fair bit about it at medical school and you know, we'll see patients with hep B but in terms of who we should be thinking about, so first of all who should we be testing, who should be at the top of our minds yeah. for testing? So for that 80,000 people that probably have it and either have it but aren't getting monitored or don't know that they have it, the main things to screen for would be um, the high um, prevalence ethnicities such as Māori, Pacific Island, Southeast Asian, Chinese, yeah. 
um, the prevalences there can be anything up to sort of 9 or even 13% in Tongan and Samoan populations. Mm. Uh, and also anyone who's immigrated to New Zealand more than 5 or 10 years ago. So you'd sort of think, oh, well, if someone's immigrated to New Zealand, all of that stuff will be found on their immigration medicals. But actually, hepatitis B has only been a standard part of immigration medicals probably in the last 10 years. So anyone right. who's immigrated from essentially anywhere around the world but been in New Zealand longer than longer. 10 years, they actually could have it. And that may not have picked up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then in terms of New Zealanders, where is it endemic in New Zealand? Um, not just in Māoris, but even um, in people living in the north and east and parts, particularly of the North Island. So um, it has been fairly prevalent. So the prevalence in New Zealand for New Zealand Māoris would be around about 6%. Yep. Um, so, yeah. And what about and from an age perspective? And should should we we be worried about children? Because obviously they're all immunised now against hepatitis B and have been for quite a few years. Um, should we be concerned about certain age groups um, or people who've got relatives who are known to be hepatitis yeah. B positive? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So the universal vaccine for hepatitis B was introduced into the New Zealand paediatric schedule around about nineteen eighty seven. Um, but that doesn't mean that every child born from 1987 afterwards, you know, got the vaccine. So, um, you know, there'll be pockets of the of the communities around the country where vaccine uptake hasn't been ideal. Yeah. And so, GPs, you'll know yourselves what your region is like as to whether you actually need to sort of think about people who were born all the way through the 90s or just the early 90s, and to keep that on your radar, um, or especially for communities where you think vaccine uptake has been um, less than ideal. And in terms of other risk groups, I mean, in terms of uh, lifestyle choices, occupations, behavioural factors, are there any other groups um, that we should be thinking about testing? So this is where it's a little bit different to hepatitis C. So mm. hepatitis C is the virus that's generally adult to adult transmission through risk factors such as um, sharing, injecting equipment or tattoos. Um, hepatitis B is far more likely to have been acquired perinatally or in early childhood. Mm. So it's, it's generally not a risk factor in terms of adult lifestyle. Adult acquisition hepatitis B generally will present acutely and clinically and the person will have you know, an acute hepatitis and yep. then we find they have new hepatitis B. So adult onset hepatitis B is, is generally it's a clinical event. Um, yeah. My understanding is that if it's acquired in adulthood, it's less likely to progress to chronic um, hepatitis B, is yes. that right? Yep, that's right. So we, in that instance, people need you know, acute workup for usually you know, quite unwell, potentially jaundiced, and then it can be monitoring either with secondary care or the GP, and usually most of them will seroconvert and clear the virus within six months of that acute hep B infection. So what we're wanting to pick up is the people who are asymptomatic, which is the vast majority of people with hep B, and they've probably had the virus all their life. They don't know they have it. <clears throat> their liver blood tests may be normal, um, and so it's a matter of sort of thinking, hey, this person's new to New Zealand or they're from a high-risk ethnicity. Yeah. Let's, let's actually just do some screening when that person comes in for their blood pressure check at age 50. Just opportunistically. Yeah. yeah, great. And once someone is established with the Hepatitis Foundation, um, is the family or the household contacts of that person also um, counselled and tested? Yes, so part of our um, new patient referral process is that our nurses do make contact with the individual and then discuss at that point whether any household or whanau members need to be screened. Yeah, okay. yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the treatment options because um, I guess a lot of GPs won't know because um, it'll be passed on to secondary care in terms of what they can treat, who they can treat, what drugs they can use. Confidence around new drugs is always tricky, particularly if you don't use them often. Yeah. You know, so if you're only using a drug once or twice a year, it's hard to feel always um, up to date with the latest guidelines. So can you tell us a little bit about the medications that are available um, to GPs yeah. um, and what advice, uh, what guide, guidelines are there for GPs to use to, yeah. um, to, to help sure. them? So yeah, so again, this is where hepatitis B is a little bit more complex than hepatitis C. We have two treatments available in New Zealand standardly. They're called Intecavir and Tenofovir. And as at about a year ago, Pharmac um, have sourced cheaper forms of these medications and they now no longer require special authority and they don't need a specialist to be the initial prescriber. However, that doesn't mean that everyone could or should or would want to start prescribing because the when to start treatment in hep B is a little bit more nuanced and we've got good guidelines on our Hepatitis Foundation website and also we have some good um, primary care information and education seats 
which our nurses can do visits to GP practices. If, if a group of GPs want to get brushed up on this, our nurses can do visits out to the practices. But broadly speaking, there's people who have very quiescent disease and just need monitoring, and then there's people who have very high viral loads and very high liver enzymes, and it's pretty clear cut, they just need treatment straight up. And in that situation, um, that's the situation where a, a GP could potentially start that treatment because it's, the need for treatment is just so clear. Um, and if we have a person on the foundation monitoring and we see that situation arise, and especially where the patient, you know, example in your, in your area in Kawarau, if the person doesn't have a car that's working or can't get to secondary care appointments or doesn't want to get all the way across to the hospital, if we know that those barriers are in place, then, then we as the Hepatitis Foundation can actually write a letter to you, the GP, and say, hey, look, your patient's got really high liver enzymes, really high hepatitis B viral load. They should be on treatment, definite benefit for them in terms of reducing their risk of cancer and liver failure long term. Here's the treatment in Tecavita, one tablet once a day long term. Please um, discuss this with your patient. And in that context, um, you know, myself and my clinical colleagues and our prep and, and our community nurses here, we're happy to take calls from GPs. Yeah. If you sort of think that the person needs treatment and you think they may not be able to get to a secondary care appointment, mm. by all means make contact with the foundation and we can either provide a conversation over the phone just to support you that that is the right decision um, and how we can help you and the patient in the community. So we want to reduce the barriers to care. Great. Well, that does make it sound slightly less daunting. Um, and good to know that the patient can still access um, you know, care from the Hepatitis Foundation in combination with the GP. Um, so once the GP is treating the patient, will the Hepatitis Foundation continue to monitor that patient? Because and my understanding is that the treatment is not a cure, it's more of a, a suppression of the virus. That's right, that's really right. So yes, even on treatment, they should still have six monthly monitoring. Yep. And if um, a person is being treated by their GP, certainly we would um, continue to do that um, prompting of blood test monitoring for the patients. Because we know that as GPs, you guys have got so much to keep a hand on yourselves with all of your patients. So we can continue to facilitate the blood test monitoring. Um, in terms of the treatment duration, for most people, it does need to be lifelong at yep. this point in time. There is a lot of research happening and maybe in the next 10 to 15 years we might be having a completely different conversation but at the moment it is um, the medicines we have in Tikavir and Tanaka are very effective at suppressing the virus down to zero or very low single double digits but as soon as you stop that tablet the virus will bounce back. So for the, there are a few select situations but really only under secondary care guidance could a person um, come off tablets. So unless otherwise informed by a secondary care specialist, it's, it's start treatment and stay on it. And, and the main reason for wanting to treat, I presume, is for preventing those long-term complications of hepatitis B, like hepatocellular carcinoma and yep. uh, cirrhosis and um, the other liver complications. Yeah, well. that's right. So the factors that we take into account to make a treatment recommendation is you know, what is the risk factors for that person to get the complication? Yeah. So liver cancer or liver failure. Yeah. So it's their age, what's their hepatitis B viral load, what are their liver enzymes doing, are they chronically up, are they chronic inflammation there? And then there's other things like other risk factors for progressive liver disease, including diabetes, obesity, hypertension, um, and male gender. So all four of those things can also increase your risks. So a person might have a moderate viral load and uh, an ALT that's only moderately elevated, but if they have all of those other metabolic syndrome risk factors, yeah. then I would be so strongly supporting that person go on treatment because they've got so many things that could be impacting their liver at that time. And does the Hepatitis Foundation have um, resources that GP practices can have um, to give to patients? So if we have people that we want to say, take this leaflet, go and have a read about it, this will tell you more about your condition, or it'll tell you more about the treatment you might get, um, so we know how to counsel those patients. Can, you, can practices order resources from... Yes, yes. We have a number of um, primary care targeted um, education yeah. pamphlets and brochures and things like that. Um, and so, as I say, our practice nurses, sorry, our community nurses can visit the GP practices and do um, you know, education for, for GPs and practice nurses. And we actually also can assist with doing... Um, inquiries into your own databases to see whether you've got people either that have previously been diagnosed and have been lost to follow-up um, or, or how we can help monitor your own population. 
So yes, our practice uh, community nurses would be very keen to visit any GP practices if they wanted to sort of build that relationship or get some more education. That's great. No, I think that's answered all of my questions today and more. So thanks very much, Alec. Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you. Cheers.